Thank you very much for being here. I'm now so used to having our weekly, weekly meetings that it is always a pleasure for me to uh, recognize uh, uh, faces that I have come to now to, to be familiar with. And I would like to thank in particular uh, uh, Professor Young, Young Reif Meyer for being here. I'm very happy to see him. I'm, uh, uh, sorry, I cannot speak Hausa, otherwise I would have <laughs> greeted you cannot, in Hausa. I cannot speak Wolof. <laughs> Speaking of Wolof, also I'm very, very happy to acknowledge the presence of Clementine Delis, obviously, who is the director, as you know, of the Welt Kultur Museum. And with Clementine Delis, I am so happy to have my own compatriot, Elaj C. Uh, one of our greatest, greatest artists in Senegal, Africa, the, the world, and he is having now an, exhibit, an exhibition at the Welt Culture Museum, and I'm particularly happy that he could make it. He just came back from Norway, and um, thank you very much for, for, for being here. I appreciate your, your presence. And it is a coincidence that today I'm going to expand uh, my notion of language, the notion of language I've been using until now, speaking of translation, as I will be precisely speaking of the language of visual arts, the language of, of forms. So in the third uh, uh, lecture, I will be still looking at translation in a space where there is the linguistic domination of an imperial language. Basically, that is the thread that is the common denominator of all my first three lectures. After this, I will be moving towards not the imperial language, but the sacred, the notion of the sacred language. So following my last uh, presentation, I will now examine translation of orality or orature, as the, the saying goes. You know that the concept of orature has been adopted to coin it according to literature, so <clears throat> I will be using that term. So the translation of orature into literature using still uh, the imperial language. <clears throat> and I will argue that the trajectory that led Amadou Ampateba from the role of a clerk of the colonial administration in charge of interpretation to that of a translator in French of his West African heritage is quite emblematic of the path uh, followed by African literary writing in European uh, uh, languages. The literary genre to which Amadou Ampateba has greatly contributed, namely the recreation uh, in French of traditional African tales is, I believe, the best possible case study of transcription, translation, and recreation of orality, of orature, uh, if you wish, into the imperial language with the result, as I have said, of establishing reciprocity and putting in touch with, to quote Antoine Berman's concept. In other words, what I'm saying, what I'm trying to show, is that the formal, simple interpreter has expanded her or his role into truly a translator, translator of their own culture, into writing in the imperial language, thus somehow establishing the kind of reciprocity between languages that could define translation as interculturality, as meeting, as putting in touch uh, uh, languages. <clears throat> so I will consider not only Amadou Ampateba, uh, uh, but also the Senegalese Birago Diop, who lived from 1906 to 1989, and the Ivorian, Bernard Dadier, who was born in 1916 and, to my knowledge, is still among us. I will first consider, then, what I call the early history of the ethnology of orature. Uh, then, 
I will examine the nature and the significance of the work of translation done by these three pioneers. And last, I will contend that true translation of orature means its recreation in the radically new form of the written text. And I will discuss uh, uh, what could be said against my position, namely the category of authenticity. Because if I, if I am saying that true translation is the recreation of orature in the imperial language, one could say, well, then where is authenticity, etc. So in, my, in the last part of my talk, I want to discuss that very category of authenticity that would be opposed to my understanding of what translation is. So my first part, the early history of the ethnology of orature that I have called the abbot and the poet. You will see why. The abbot is uh, uh, Abbe Grégoire, and the poet is French poet Blaise Sandrars. I'm going to talk about them. It can be said that the post-colonial uh, gesture of affirming equivalence and reciprocity between the imperial languages and the languages and cultures of Africa is anterior to formal colonization. It could be considered that it started when I take just France. And I do not know of any equivalent elsewhere, but you might educate me uh, during the discussion. It started then with the publication by Abbe Grégoire, the abbot, uh, who lived between 1750 and 1831, as you know. Uh, in, 188, in 1808, of his famous, most famous work, entitled in French, De la littérature des nègres, Recherche sur leurs facultés intellectuelles, leur qualité morale et leur littérature. Of, Negro, of the literature of Negroes, uh, 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 research, forschung, uh, on their uh, intellectual faculties, their moral qualities, and their literature. I am getting there. You will be surprised with my German soon. <laughs> Three connected remarks are to be made concerning that book here. First of all, the work is, you probably know about it, is the work of a revolutionary militant, and more precisely, an abolitionist. You know that Abbe Grégoire was at the time engaged in the moral combat for the human rights that had been declared to be universal 20 years earlier by the French Revolution, only to be negated 13 years later by the reestablishment of slavery, which had been abolished in 18. So this reestablishment happened in 1802. Following that decision, discriminatory laws are put in place against so-called colored people, uh, when in that same year, 1802, access to metropolitan France was prohibited for them. The following year, mayors and local administrators in France, in metropolitan France, were asked not to register any kind of mixed marriages. And in 1807, there was a project of taking a census of all black people living on the territory of France in order to enroll them in the army. So this is the context in which Abbe Grégoire wrote his book. So the general climate of censorship against any kind of political publication under, this is when uh, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, obviously, was reigning. Of, uh, so against any kind of political publication made it impossible to publicly protest the measures. So Abbe Grégoire chose to present a cultural work instead of a political uh, 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 work. <coughs> so, and this is my second uh, remark. The affirmation of the literary production of Negroes is for this militant of the evangelical and republican message of human fraternity, a cultural and political response at once 
to those he called enemies of humanity as a consequence of their being friends of slavery. If you are a friend of slavery, Abbe Gregoire uh, said you cannot be you, but an enemy of humanity. The underlying assumption that the humanity of the human finds its best and highest expression in literary production and more generally in artistic creation. It is in artistic creation that the human being expresses what truly makes her human. And that there lies the very foundation for universal fraternity is of great importance. The literature of the Negro speaks in fact for all the other traits that are mentioned in the subtitle of the book, namely their intellectual faculties or their moral qualities. All that is under one concept, that of literature. My third remark concerns what is called literature here. Abbe Gregoire basically evokes in his book any black person that, does, that has done some intellectual or cultural work. He quotes everybody. Uh, for example, uh, Anton Wilhelm Amo, this uh, uh, philosopher from who was originated, who originated from Ghana and ended in his this very country, being a professor of philosophy at Halle uh, uh, near uh, Berlin. I just learned that there is an Amo lecture uh, every single year, and I have had the honor of being invited to to go there, but not probably while I'm uh, here. Okay, so um, he also makes, he doesn't just quote names. He also makes a, an important reference to oral literature that I would like to quote here. This is what uh, Abbe Gregoire writes in chapter seven of his book. Once France had its trouvère and its troubadour, just like Germany had its Minsinger and Scotland its minstrels. Negroes have their own, named griots, who also go to kings in order to do what is done in all courts, praise and lie with wit. Their wives, the griot, do roughly the same thing as Alme in Egypt or Bayaders in India. It is yet another, another trait of conformity with the traveling woman of the troubadour. But those trouvères, those minsingers, those minstrels were the predecessors of Malherbe, Corneille, Racine, Shakespeare, Pope, Gessner, Klopstock, etc. In every country, genius is but the spark hidden inside the stone. As soon as it is hit by iron, it is prompt to burst out. End of quote. We find here a topic which will be very important for the ethnology of oratory, namely the notion of an actual equivalence between the oral creations, such as the literature of the minstrels on the one hand, and African oral arts considered here the work of griots on the other hand, and of a potential equivalence between European written literature and the literature that will be produced in written form as some sort of creative translation from oratio. The same evocation of a principle of equivalence is at the heart of French poet Blaise Sandrard, uh, 1887, who died in 1961. And this is now after the abbot, the poet. Apropos Blaise Sandrard and his, um, uh, uh, he, he wrote in uh, uh, 1921, he put together a volume of African tales, myths, etc., collected under the title Ontology Neg. I'm sure Moritz must have that in his uh, 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 library. Now, concerning Blaise Sandrard and his anthology, I would like to consider two points that are both important for my reflection on translation as interculturality. One is the movement of translation of African arts into European languages, and one is what the poet says about the African languages that are translated into French in the anthology. Concerning the first point, Blaise Sandra's enterprise of putting together this collection, 
of African tales translated into French has to be understood within the context, the general context around World War I of the movement by poets and artists, mainly in France, uh, um, who advocated equivalence to and translatability into the European language of African arts. I mentioned mainly in France, you did have here in Germany the publication, uh, two publications during that same period by uh, Karl Einstein. Uh, uh, one is Negro Plastic and the, uh, the other, um, maybe I wrote it down, hopefully, yeah, Afrikanische Plastic in 1920. It is the general same uh, atmosphere. Uh, uh, um, and so Blaise Sandrard belongs to that, to, that, uh, to that movement. And one of the most prominent uh, proponents of this uh, uh, translatability, um, these are my own terms, of African arts into European languages was the French poet uh, Guillaume Apollinaire, who died at the end of World War I, as you know. He was particularly vocal as he wrote before the war many articles in newspapers calling for the transfer of African artifacts gathered at the Ethnographical Museum of Place Trocadero in Paris to the Louvre, where they truly belonged for him. Apollinaire's message was the following. Do not consider these objects simply as testimonies of religious rituals whose value then is entirely in what it func its function is to represent or to point towards. So do not leave these objects crammed together there and left to the sheer ethnographical curiosity of rare visitors. Consider them, on the contrary, as works of art and as such take them to the Louvre where they will speak their true language as a language of visual forms. Obviously, this is not a quote from Apollinaire. I am putting these words in his mouth from uh, reading his uh, articles advocating this transfer. And I believe this is still uh, a debate going on. It is interesting that uh, Musée du Quai Branly in France uh, uh, has put together at one point all these articles by uh, Apollinaire because somehow the creation of Musée du Quai Branly is a kind of vindication of what Apollinaire was calling for. I know it is a very uh, vivid debate between ethnologists, certain ethnologists, and the people from the Musée du Quai Branly because they decided to put minimal information on the objects and they wanted the objects to speak for themselves, to speak the language of their own visual forms just in the way in which Apollinaire thought that this should be uh, also done then. <coughs> Precisely what was at stake behind the recognition of African artifacts as works of art was what Benjamin, Walter Benjamin, has called their translatability. Either the artifacts are considered enclosed in their religious untranslatable language as objects for the ethnologist, or they are understood to speak the language of their visual form, which could then acquire a new life in another language, namely a European uh, uh, one. And it could be said that when he made the move to incorporate African masks into his painting of the Demoiselle d'Avignon, Picasso effectuated such a gesture of translation from another language into his own one, the one he had been looking for, especially during that year, 1906, the Anus Mirabilis 1906, where after having tried again and again, he decided that he would not paint anymore the faces of those ladies of, of Avignon, but just erase the faces and put instead these uh, African uh, 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 masks. <clears throat> what Picasso has done was to, I quote, release in his own language 
the pure language of forms, which was under the spell of another, to liberate the language imprisoned in an African work in his recreation of that work. Now I have cheated, because the quote I just quoted, I made you believe it was from Picasso. It was not. It is a quote from Walter Benjamin, and he is talking about something totally different. But I am using it to just make uh, uh, clear my own point that what Walter Benjamin is saying about the pure language that one meets in translation could be perfectly applicable to what Picasso has done, translating the language, the visual language of these objects into the new language that he was himself uh, 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 looking for. I would, be, I would love to discuss that uh, later. So I have just cited uh, this important passage from Walter Benjamin's The Task of the Translator to emphasize the point that what Picasso did transferring African art into his work was a translation in Benjamin's sense, and second, that such a translation was part of what the German philosopher calls the afterlife of the work. As you know, for Walter Benjamin, a work is translatable means that it calls for an afterlife. Translation gives to it an afterlife. Afterlife is not just survival. On the contrary, it is the abundance of life which manifests itself, so to say, in the capacity of the work to be uh, uh, translated. We could see here that translatability supposes the capacity to be detached from one soil so that the meaning of the work is not at all in its rootedness. <coughs> Let's call it its capacity for decentering and for voyage. And I am, uh, well, sorry to call upon you, but I do believe that uh, the work of my compatriot and uh, whom I admire so much, uh, uh, LC, is, uh, 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 I believe, uh, a good illustration of what I'm saying, this notion of something, the, the, the work he is capable of doing with the tradition, without paying attention to the tradition, making it move, incorporating in a new life or an afterlife in uh, uh, Walter Benjamin's parlance is something that I'm very sensitive to when I uh, 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 see his work. So this capacity to be detached from one's own soil, the capacity for decentering and voyage is uh, important, and I would like now to say that this is the same gesture moving from the language of uh, visual forms, plastic forms. It is the same gesture which is done by writers of orature, such as Amadou Ampateba, Bernard Dajé, or Binagojo. But first, the second point I wanted to make, I announced a, a first point, so I need to have a second point before I move to what I just said. It concerned the very short notice that was written by Blaise Sandrard as a presentation of his anthology Negre. Actually, most of the notice is a long quote from British colonial administrator and linguist Robert Needham Kust, which says this. Those 581 languages and dialects are the most diverse, and if we only consider the 168 languages from the Bantu fam family, used by millions of Africans from Kafre land. Kafre land, I, I translated actually, the, the French word is Kafreri. As you know, Kafre is a very derogative term that was used in South Africa, uh, applied to uh, um, Malays, uh, essentially. So from Kafre land to the Gulf of Guinea, they are, says Kast, excessively rich. Every mound, hill, mount, or peak has a name, and so has every river, every small valley, and every plain. It would take a lifetime to discuss the meaning of those names. It is not shortage, but overabundance of names that mislead travelers. The richness of language is such that there are dozens and dozens of words to indicate varieties in walking, in strolling, in bragging. Every kind of walk is expressed by a special word. 
And after uh, uh, quoting Kast, Blaise Sandras concludes his notice with the following. The study of the languages and the literature of primitive races is one of the most essential knowledge for the history of the human mind and the most reliable illustration of the law of intellectual constancy of which Rémy de Gourbon, Gourmont had a, a, a glimpse. This is a, a trope, a topos, that you will find all along, actually, in African literature. The notion, this notion, that you have a, a translation creates some sort of reciprocity and equivalence. Although the translation is given in the imperial language, in the text translated, somehow, the original language with all its richness is present and therefore is put in touch, and I come back to that expression again uh, from Antoine Bermond, is put in touch with the imperial language, creating, so to say, against the situation of domination, some kind of situation of reciprocity. My second big point, I'll go faster. Now, writing as translation and recreation of the afterlife of orature using afterlife in the Benjamin uh, sense. The point I want to examine is the sense in which people like Ampate Ba or Bernard Dagier or uh, uh, Birago Job are translators of their cultures, not just like the ethnographers who translated the tales collected by Blaise Sandras, but like Picasso, who reinvented the visual forms presented to him by translating in the etymological sense of transferring, translatio in, 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 in Latin has exactly that meaning of transferring, uh, transferring them into a new uh, language. Ampateba, and I mentioned this last time, is famous among many other reasons for his declaration that in Africa, an elder who dies is a library in flames. Such a declaration, which became a proverbial, seems to indicate a sense of urgency of recording and transcribing into the written word the treasures of orature under the threat of disappearance. So it conveys the notion of a crisis in transmission, meaning that the elders are not finding anymore the ears or the hearts or the minds that would uh, uh, be available and open to receiving uh, their teaching. But more importantly than that, there is here a paradox, which is that saving orature by fixating it in a written form, be it in the original African language or the European one, is still a form of death for that orature. What dies is orature as a living movement. This will become a topos for many a writer who would always lament the fact that their work pales when compared with the ideal form of the oral performance. I mean, this is uh, uh, writers playing it cute. They would write something and say, oh, it may be beautiful, but if you had seen what it would have been in my original language, etc., etc., this notion that everything written is uh, sort of pales in comparison with the real oral stuff. Leopold said our saying, oh, and, and, and this, in, uh, this uh, <coughs> <coughs> the introduction written by Biragojo to his tales by Amadou Kumba. Uh, published in 1947, offers a perfect model of that topos. In it, he laments that his writing would never be able to capture and translate, I quote him, the voice, the brilliance, and the faces of his old griot, Amadou Kumba, whose name is written in the very title of his collection of tales as some co-author of the work. It is very interesting that the title is Le Conte d'Amadou Kumba by Birago Job, as if Amadou Kumba and Birago Job were somehow co-authors, one of them being the author of the orature, while the other is the author of the literature. Senghor, who, Leopold Sedar Senghor, who wrote the preface of the second collection 
uh, uh, the new tales of Amadou Kumba in 1958 mocks uh, such a topos that he considers a writer playing it cute, une coquetterie d'écrivain, as he says in French. Recalling the Italian saying, traduttore traditore, a translator is a traitor. He insists that Biragojov's translation of the sayings of the griot Amadou Kumba are an act of creation or recreation of text in a radically new form, where the original language and the language of the translation are put in touch with each other, coming back to my Bermanian obsession, and where it leaves its afterlife in uh, Benjamin's uh, 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 sense. Now, what is said of Birago Job could be also said of Bernard Badie. Now, I don't have time to really enter their works, but uh, for those of you, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, uh, the tales by Birago Job or, or Bernard Badie, you can see how they, way they, they play with precisely recreating oratio. They pay no attention at all to any kind of ethnographical exactness or authenticity. On the contrary, you have uh, uh, in them uh, this pleasure of the text, as Bart uh, uh, said, this true uh, uh, pleasure of writing, which is the sign that the work, the original work, is highly translatable and has within itself a force that is going to determine what its afterlife is, uh, uh, will be. Now, it is assumed that Amadou Ampateba would be still different from the two, because in his case, uh, 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 as he had been an interpreter, an informant who turned ethnographer of orature, he is supposed to be more on the side of fidelity in the act of translation than the side of freedom. As you know, this couple, fidelity versus freedom, is uh, uh, um, uh, the oscillation of translation. We remember that his career took actually a new turn during World War II when in 1942 he was appointed as an ethnographer at IFAN, Institut Fondamental d'Afrique Noire, by Theodore Monod. And, uh, um, he was supposed, it was his job, to transcribe and translate traditions and other kinds of ethnotexts, as they could be called, uh, 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 that, uh, that is, texts that were demanded, so to say, and which were an expression of the group's identity and self-affirmation. This notion of an ethnographical demand to which the writing uh, 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 heeds is very interesting, actually, because it all works as if the true incentive, the driving force behind the creation of African literature was precisely that ethnographical uh, 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 demand. And it is true when you look at the reality on the field that the same ethnographical demand was addressed, for example, to the students at Ecole Normale William Ponty uh, for their cahier, these students at Ecole Normale William Ponty uh, 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 used to have these assignments for their vacation, uh, go back home and describe basically your customs, your behaviors, your society, and so on, uh, uh, so forth. So my colleague at Columbia, Vincent de Ban, is absolutely right when he makes the observation that ethnographical contributions authorized literary self-expression as if writing started by heeding ethnographical demand uh, before getting more and more autonomous on the side of, of creativity. Uh, Vincent de Ban speaks here against those in response to those who, like Elini Kunduriotis, had made the point that engaging in writing fiction was a way for African authors, on the contrary, to write back against the empire and one science of Africa, uh, which was really the science, the colonial science par excellence, which was ethno ethnology. So to say that actually literature was not defined against ethnology uh, 
but in continuity with ethnology is the point made by Vincent Duval. I think both positions are right. He is right in terms of the fact of these ethnographical demand triggering some kind of literary writing, but his opponent is right in the sense that literary writing could only be possible against precisely this notion of ethnographical uh, exactness, or at least that is uh, 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 the position I would like to uh, <clears throat> defend uh, uh, here, because uh, uh, I consider that a translation, uh, in the sense I have used it, uh, should be understood as recreating uh, totally in another language and continuing the afterlife of the work according to the logic of the receiving uh, 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 language. So even Ampateba, who could pretend that what he was doing was ethnographical work, was actually fully like Birago Diop or Bernard Lagier, a creator, <coughs> using this language of this guy. One, one of his uh, critique, Alain Ricard, say that Amanu Ampateba, I quote, is a writer and first and foremost a writer in spite of all the disguises he borrowed. The same language of disguise is used by Valérie Cher Tam when examining the literary and cinematographical myth that the griot has become, and she speaks of, I quote, the Russian dolls type of masqueradings where the griot, the storyteller, and the writer fit into each other. Now, this definition that I am adopting of the notion of translation as true recreation of a work and uh, um, which gives to it its afterlife, I would like to challenge that with now the ethnographical uh, demand for <clears throat> authenticity. So this is my last short point, the ethnographical category of authenticity <coughs> and translation. The question is not so much that literature started with ethnographical demand. It is rather on the side of reception and critique of that literature. It is rather that ethnological posture and discourse are often adopted in the reception of African literary texts, imposing upon them the category of authenticity. There may not be a demand for the exact transcription of orature, but there is the notion that what makes African literature and for that matter, art in general, authentic is its keeping contact with orality understood as to be quintessentially African. The assumed underlying notion is that it is of the essence of African cultures to be oral, and therefore that essence must be manifest in any authentic African literary creation that a novel is able to translate well the African art of the oral word or to render the brilliance of the griot is, I believe, a very lazy but widespread characterization of African literature. From such a perspective, it seems then that the truth of African writing must always lie, lie in some kind of or text truth, I'm using Ortex, Derrida's notion, uh, a, a truth outside the text itself, which would be, of course, orality. And I would like to respond to that kind of approach in two points. The first is what I would call the, the lessons from one of the most important novels in Francophone African literature, namely, Yambo Wologem's Devoir de Violence, Bound to Violence, uh, published as you uh, remember in 1968. The second, which I will just evoke, is the simple historical fact that there is no reason to consider that orality is in the essence of African cultures. Malian writer, Yambo Wologem's uh, uh, Le Devoir de Violence, Bound to Violence, or Das Gebot 
der Gewalt. <laughs> Published in 1968, has had quite a singular destiny. When it was published in 1968 as the first novel of an unknown young Malian, the singularity of that voice was just striking. The saga of a, an imaginary dynasty of cruel rulers, the, the safe, the, the rulers, the safe. And actually, not many people have remarked that the word safe in Arab means the sword. Uh, uh, for the name of that uh, dynasty. So the saga of that imaginary dynasty of cruel uh, rulers of an imaginary African empire named Nakem, from the beginning of the 13th century uh, to today is the general subject matter of the novel, which evokes periods such as slavery, trans-Saharan and transatlantic, colonialism and neo-colonialism. It is, for those of you who know the novel and those of you who do not, please stop everything else and go read it. Uh, uh, it is a history of cruelty, of murder and massacres, of incest and rapes, where the rare moments of humanity and love are only poses before the flood of blood and tears takes over again. The accumulation in that novel and crescendo of horrifying scenes makes the reader feel breathless until the strange and calm final scene between two chess players, one of them being the unsubmersible, unsinkable uh, representative of the dynasty of the Saif, and the other one being an abbot, the abbot Henry. The novel uh, uh, was hailed when it was published and was awarded the prestigious Prix Renaudot. Then it was discovered that quite a few passages from it were reappropriations from different texts by authors such as Swarjbart, Le Dernier des Justes, Graham Greene, Maupassant, and others. So the book was quickly thrown under the bus, as the saying goes, uh, by the publisher who was scared of possible lawsuits. And the book became synonymous with the scandal of plagiarism, and it was buried. So Yambo uh, Wologem uh, was hailed one day, and the next day he was uh, uh, the worst possible being on earth. It revealed itself, actually, the book revealed itself as unsinkable as the Saif dynasty. And it was rescued mainly by American literary critique, uh, Christopher Miller, uh, Christopher Wise or Kwame Anthony Apia wrote about it. And that critique read it under the category of postmodern intertextuality, considering the way in which it played with many texts as translations, and not just these big texts by Graham Greene, etc. People should have remarked that the, 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 the novel plays with the Quran, plays with the Bible, plays with so-called oral tradition, etc. Not just these authors who scared the, the publisher. And afterwards, the book came back to France with its kind of American aura symbolized by the preface by Christopher Wise of the new edition by Le Serpent à Prume. Why am I recalling this story of Yambo Wologem's Devoir de Violence uh, that you probably uh, uh, remember? What I want to stress here is that when it was hailed, the book was celebrated as the authentic account of the African past and the African word, a word of blood and violence different from the supposedly rosy picture usually presented. And negritude was explicitly evoked as responsible for such a kind of rosy painting of the African past. So the critique who hailed uh, Le Devoir de Violence fabricated that novel as authentic in contrast and against another fabricated picture of writers who were supposed to have been selling a heavenly Africa. So, but to accuse negritude of having been selling a rosy Africa, where is it in the literature of negritude? Where could one find writing by Senghor where he would say that Africa 
was a rosy picture. In fact, no, he does speak of the so-called kingdom of childhood, but he speaks of the kingdom of childhood precisely as a poet. That is to say, the evocation by a poet of the worldview of a child. And when it comes to his engagement with the actual history of Africa, there are quite a few in his work, maybe Shaka, the poem dramatic Shaka. And when you read Senghor Shaka, well, the Africa of Shaka has nothing heavenly or rosy. It would be closer, actually, to the Africa of Yambo uh, Wologem. So the critique wanted to consider that Yambo Wologem was authentic. They fabricated him and his novel as authentic. And they wanted to be, that to be against something in, unauthentic. So they created it as well, saying, OK, African writers, until now, the Negritude people have been having a rosy, heavenly Africa. Now is the translation of the true Africa. None of those were true or false. They did not just fall under the category of authenticity. They were about literary creation. The lesson from the devoir de violence is that it is precisely, and that is what is interesting in the scandal, it is precisely the category of the authentic that has exploded in the face of the ethnologizing critique, as I would call them. The book was just a parody of orality. The, the fact that the writing was a good translation of orality was also hailed. But when you look the, uh, at the book in details, it is a parody of orality, not a reproduction of orality. And it is done in a very brilliant way. All the interjections, the exclamations that you find in Le Devoir de Violence are purely fabricated. Yambo Wologem puts together many different languages, Wolof among them. Wolof, uh, Bamana, uh, I guess, any language that they speak in that Banjagara region of, of his, etc. In other words, the whole book was a fabrication and had this wonderful lesson that actually literature is about texts, is about writings, and it comes from other texts and other writings. There is not such a thing as a kind of Platonist truth of orality from which the writing is going to derive its reality or its authenticity. Now my second point, and I feel that you are tired, so my second point is going to be just one second, is Namely, that there is no reason to consider African cultures as essentially oral, and this is something that I will develop in my lecture on from Athens to Baghdad to Timbuktu, where I will be speaking precisely about written cultures. So this is to be continued next time. Thank you for your patience.